Well, today we continue our study in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31. Last week, we hit on a couple of topics that I'd like to expand on a little bit. And because they'll make the context of chapter 31 a little clearer. If you'll remember, God speaks to Jeremiah in chapter 30. And he instructs him as he's sitting in a prison cell to write down the things that God speaks to him. And he tells them that he's to write it down for himself. To recount the faithfulness of God, in my estimation. And then secondly, we find that something happens to the writings that Jeremiah produces while he's in prison, and it becomes a pivotal part of things going forward for the nation of Israel. And the reason for that? Because it finds its way into the hands of a man named Daniel. And when Daniel receives that word, after almost 70 years of captivity in Babylon, God speaks to Daniel through that word. And then through the angel Gabriel. Let me set the stage a little bit. Because in some circles there's some confusion about this. As you heard me say before, there are some basic rules to biblical interpretation. Number one, unless something is presented clearly as a simile, that the scripture is to be taken literally. Number two, in order to appropriately interpret a passage of scripture, one needs to begin by determining where the unit of thought starts and where the unit of thought ends. Otherwise, you can prove anything out of the Bible you like by pulling verses out of context. Can I prove it to you? Judas went and hanged himself. I can show you that scripture. I can show you one that says, go and do ye likewise. I would not recommend that because that's a very bad hermeneutic. It's not appropriate. But unfortunately, there are those that teach that way in a consistent manner. So you must know where the unit of thought starts, where God begins to speak, and where that subject is concluded. The next rule is that you must interpret the Old Testament from the lens of the New Testament. The New Testament is the commentary on the types and shadows of the Old Testament. If you try to use the Old Testament to interpret the New Testament, you'll get it wrong. Does that mean the Old Testament does not have value? Absolutely not. It has tremendous value. But the New Testament always, always is the determining factor in the interpretation of the old. Next, you must know who is speaking. After that, you must know who they're speaking to. And then finally, you must know something about the occasion of the comments that are being made. What is the setting? What's happening at that particular time? What is that in light of context? And when you have that, then you're ready to interpret what the scripture has to say. And I offer some comments this afternoon in the interest of context. Daniel's still in jail, or not Daniel, but rather Jeremiah is still in jail. And Jeremiah is not talking about the time in which he's living. 
And we'll get to that in just a moment. There are those who say that the Jews blew it by not accepting Jesus as Messiah. And because they blew it, that God has completely rejected the Jewish people. And that all the promises that are listed in the scripture, all the promises made to Israel, have been now applied to the church. And the reality is, the scripture does not teach that. They go on to say that the promises of God to Israel have somehow been transferred to a spiritual Israel. By that they mean the church. I.e. the church, because we've embraced Jesus Christ, has supplanted Israel. And that's not accurate. The problem with that particular interpretation is that it leads to consequences that many that teach that have not thought through. Let me give you an example. If the church has become heir to everything that's said about Israel, and if God is never again going to deal with Israel, then if you'll recall from our study of the book of Reve the Revelation of Jesus Christ, that means that the church goes through the wrath of God. And the wrath of God is poured out on his church. Well, let me share a few scriptures with you that would seem to throw a monkey wrench into that idea. These are good scriptures to hang on to, particularly when you're hearing the radio in this area with those who claim to be biblical prophecy scholars. Now remember, Revelation tells us clearly that in the last three and a half years of the final seven year period, that the wrath of God is going to be poured out. But the big question is, on who? Romans 5, 9. Much more than, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Now wait a minute. If we're saved from wrath, how can we be there? 1 Thessalonians 1, 10. And wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. If we are not appointed to wrath, we can't be in a place where God's wrath is, is poured out. It doesn't pass the logic test. So what's the conclusion? The conclusion is the things that are being spoken of during that period of time, we're not here. Amen? We are not here. You say, well, where are we? That's where you start reading in Revelation, the fourth chapter. Because we've all gone to supper. It's the wedding supper of the Lamb. Amen? Amen. If you can't say amen to that, we're going to have an altar call after this. All right? And you can be sure that you've got an invitation to supper. Okay? Good enough. So, Revelation, or Revelation, uh, Jeremiah chapter 31 is a continuation of the 30th chapter. And it speaks about a time that is not yet. Now, in order to understand the context of what Jeremiah is talking about, a good chapter to read is Daniel, the ninth chapter. Because in Daniel, the ninth chapter, 
It records an event where, Jer- where Daniel is seeking God specifically concerning the repatriation of Israel back to the land that God had given them. They've been in captivity almost 70 years. Jeremiah says that he came to understand, or Daniel says that he came to understand that Israel's captivity would last for 70 years. And how did he come to understand that? Because the ninth chapter of Daniel specifically tells us that he was reading the prison book that Jeremiah had written, the very same book that we are studying. And when he read it, Jeremiah spelled it out in the 30th chapter very clearly that 70 years was the time that Israel would be there. Well, you might reasonably ask, why did God settle on 70 years? If you remember in the law of Moses, For six years, they were to till the ground and they were to be involved in agricultural pursuits. And they would live from year to year based on what they had grown, the animals that they had brought along year after year. In the sixth year, however, God promised to prosper them with enough to carry over so that they didn't have to plant in the seventh year. They were to allow the land to rest in the seventh year. Now, people have a really, some people have a really odd perception of what God is like. How would you like to work for a boss that gave you every seventh year off? Okay, can you say amen to that one? Yes, amen. Complete rest a vacation, a year long, every seventh year. The difficulty is that Israel never did it. Never. They never trusted God for that seventh year. And as a matter of fact, they did it 70 times. And their captivity for 70 years was based on the land getting its due and getting its rest. Daniel is now reading Jeremiah and he finds that the 70 years are just about finished. Daniel, immediately after he hears that message, begins to go to prayer. And when he goes to prayer, Daniel 9 tells us that he asked God's forgiveness for the sins, his own sins. He seeks God and he asks God for forgiveness for the sins of his nation. And the scripture says that when he did, he makes statements that indicate that he does not hold what has happened to Israel and to Judah to God's account as if it was unjust. Moreover, he makes statements that make absolutely clear that God is just, God is right, God did the right thing, and that God actually did nothing more than honor the Sinai covenant, where he had made a covenant with Israel that said, you do this and I'll do that. And if you choose not to do this, this will be the consequences. God told the absolute truth. We were talking before the service today, myself and some of the other guys. And at any rate, one of the themes that came up was this entire business of how the world treats God. Alex was witnessing to his own son. And he was talking about during the course of that witness how his son seemed to have an objection to everything he brought up. You know, the world does identically the same thing. The world accuses God for sickness. 
The world accuses God for children who die young. The world accuses God for war. The world accuses God for turmoil in individual lives. And you know what the reality is? He's innocent. He didn't do that. The reality is God's original intention was that man would enjoy the earth as his possession given by God in a perfect state with absolute help and fellowship with God with no sickness, no sin, no hate, no war, no death, no IRS. None of those things. But Adam and Eve made a decision that they would believe that God had held on on them and lied. And when they did, they handed control of this earth over to Satan. And war and pestilence, having to work too many hours, having too much month at the end of the money, sickness, everything. God had nothing to do with that. You know who did that? Us. And God is perpetually unjustly accused. He's the only one that came up with a solution, an answer, in all those circumstances. One of the big takeaways from Daniel 9, and I'll try to move along here quickly so we can get to our text. One of the big takeaways is Daniel's expression of the fact that his heart and his mind had come to the place where he was in complete agreement with the actions and motivations of God. His thinking and his heart had come in line with God's thinking and God's heart. Do you know what we call that? Repentance. Repentance isn't just not doing the bad stuff anymore. Repentance means...